um, and everyone else. Some of this is redundant for all the faculty, you know. We always put the acute liver failure talk at the beginning of the year. It's um, essential on-call um, material. So this is the outline of what I'm going to cover. Uh, we'll go through definitions. Um, I want to spend some time going through uh, the differential diagnosis of the various different causes of acute liver failure. Uh, management, may, management and prognosis is going to uh, differ greatly depending on what the etiology is. Um, we'll review prognostic predictors, King's College criteria, and other prognostic <coughs> models. And then I'm going to talk about aspects of ICU care. So this is very much a multidisciplinary um, team effort trying to keep these patients alive to make it to transplant. At the same time, you don't want to transplant a patient who doesn't need a, trans, uh, a, a transplant. So um, there's, there's a bit of um, prognostic um, uh, forecasting that you have to do with these patients. Um, we'll talk about the role of liver transplantation, briefly about outcomes with li acute liver failure. Um, I put this on here, acute on chronic liver failure, not because I'm going to talk about it, but because I'm not going to talk about it. Um, I, I just want to highlight that this is a very distinct entity from acute on chronic liver failure, which we see a lot on our inpatient service. When you're on call, you will get calls from outside hospitals describing a uh, you know, patient who's jaundiced, encephalopathic with elevated INR, and um, everything could sound like acute liver failure, but in fact, it may just be acute on chronic liver failure, and the management is very different. So um, I just want to highlight that, that difference there. So the clinical definition of acute liver failure um, requires a triad. So you need um, coagulopathy, as um, defined by um, elevated INR, and you must have encephalopathy, and the duration um, has to be uh, relatively short. Um, encephalopathy is a necessary component in diagnosing acute liver failure. You could have um, a patient, for example, who has drug-induced liver injury with coagulopathy. It's all new with no underlying liver disease, but if they don't have encephalopathy, you can't call it acute liver failure. You can call it acute liver injury. This happens a lot on the inpatient service with the house staff. They're presenting a case and they say acute liver failure, so it's important to point out to the house staff that you have to have encephalopathy to call it acute liver failure. Um, importantly, these patients um, should not have underlying cirrhosis, and again, this is kind of um, referencing the difference between acute liver failure and acute on chronic liver failure. Patients who have underlying cirrhosis and liver disease um, have a different kind of outcome when, when, they, when they have these sorts of clinical um, presentations. And so um, it's important when you're seeing these patients and examining them to look for stigmata of chronic liver disease, spider angiometa, ascites, um, splenomegaly, uh, so they shouldn't have signs of chronic portal hypertension. That said, sometimes in rare cases where you have hepatic necrosis and collapse on imaging, the liver can look like a cirrhotic liver. It can look shrunken with a nodular uh, appearance, and you can even have ascites. So um, just keep that in mind that um, ascites doesn't necessarily um, mean that this is a patient with chronic uh, cirrhosis. The exception to um, this definition where we can say that patients um, can't have underlying liver disease is um, Wilson's patients, so they can have liver disease for a long time, chronic liver disease, even fibrosis, um, but then when they decompensate, they decompensate in an in a acute um, manner, like acute liver failure. The other exceptions are um, patients who have chronic hepatitis B and then develop a flare so they can behave like uh, acute liver failure patients in terms of their mortality and the um, acuity and short time course within which they can decompensate um, and autoimmune hepatitis as well. These patients kind of have more of a smoldering uh, time course and then they'll suddenly kind of fall off a cliff. Um, for uh, listing purposes, you can list a Wilson's disease patient as a fulminant. However, that Hep B and autoimmune patients um, require a, 
a narrative. They don't kind of automatically get listed as, as status one. Chris, um, yeah. It would be fair to say that, practically speaking, it's allowed a status one listing because the natural history of these kinds of acute and chronic liver failures are grim without transplant. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. And so because, um, so, so, so be, because these are patients who have a grim mortality without transplant, there's an urgency to get them to, uh, to a transplant to give them timely access to organs. And so when these patients get listed, they get listed as status 1A, which means that we open, uh, we're, we're open to um, organ availab available organ offers across, uh, you know, uh, across the country. So um, these patients rise up to the top of the list. And um, because you know, livers are in short supply, we have to be a little bit more stringent for liver for, for UNOS 1A um, listing purposes when we define these patients for listing. And so the, the UNOS um, criteria to list for 1A are onset of encephalopathy within eight weeks of onset of the first symptoms of liver disease, absence of pre-existing liver disease, except in cases of Wilson's, Again, Hep B autoimmune, you would kind of need to explain with a narrative. And then they have to be in the ICU with one of the following. They either have to be on event, um, on um, renal replacement therapy, or the INR threshold you see here is a bit higher than the clinical definition. So INR greater than, greater than two. So sometimes we'll have patients on the floor who, who, who um, we see are progressing into acute liver failure, and we have to move them into an ICU bed in order to list them as status 1A. So as Jean was um, mentioning, this is a clinical condition that has a grim prognosis. So these are the outcomes. Um, this is data from the acute liver failure study group. So it's a multi-center study um, collecting and reporting outcomes of acute liver failure. It's Acute liver failure is kind of one of these orphan diseases where it's so rare that it's hard to generate data from single center experiences. So all the data comes out of multi-center um, uh, collaborations. And so the US, it's the US Acute Liver Failure Study Group. And so what you see here in yellow is um, patients who uh, have spontaneous survival. In orange here, patients who underwent liver transplantation. And then here in purple, death without liver transplantation. So, um, so the, the likelihood of surviving without a liver transplant is less than 50%. So most of these patients either die or they get, liver, or get, they get transplanted. Hence the urgency of um, getting these patients to a transplant center when you, when you get the call. Um, there is some clinical distinction between um, hyperacute, acute, and subacute presentations. The hyperacute uh, presentations have a um, quick onset within a week, and these patients can present with profound coagulopathy, uh, less jaundice, and in general, their survival with transplant tends to be a bit better. Um, a lot of this is related to the etiology, so Tylenol um, and some of the viral hepatitis um, causes can give you this presentation. The subacute ones are sort of these smoldering dilly cases or autoimmune cases um, where the onset is over several week period. Um, they may look more jaundiced uh, than demonstrating you know, other lab abnormalities and their survival without transplant is relatively uh, poor. So this is like, um, who's on service? Ms. Yeah, the, 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 the lady with the CMV and the drug-induced liver injury who's just sort of smoldering with a elevated bilirubin. Okay. Um, so let's just spend a little bit of time going through the differential diagnosis of acute liver failure. This is one of these kinds of cases um, where it's a, it's, it's a new patient you're seeing for the first time. They're coming over in transfer, and it really, like, pays to spend time getting a good history a lot of times you may not get the history from the patient themselves. You're going to need to do some sleuthing, some collateral, talking to family, calling pharmacies. And it's important because um, the management and prognosis can, bear, can, can, can make all the difference from one cause to another. So the viral causes are uh, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, plus or minus delta, hepatitis E, 
um, HSV, CMV, EVV, varicella, zoster. So these are all the viral serologies that you're going to send off in the beginning. Um, drugs and toxins are a common culprit for acute liver failure. This is just a laundry list here, but I'll point out um, Tylenol, of course. Um, mushroom poisoning can, can lead to liver failure. Um, ecstasy, cocaine. And um, don't forget the alternative uh, herbal remedies. So this is where history taking is really important. Um, and then a lot of the um, idiosyncratic types of drug reactions can lead to liver failure, particularly INH, uh, rifampin, and um, the anti-seizure medications. Um, I think herbal remedies are the big one. Sometimes the patients, it's like you take four histories and it's finally the medical student they confess to that they've been taking some Chinese herbs or some liver cleanse or something else because they don't consider it a medication. But 50% of the delis, Joe or Duvati, 50% of the delis in this country are caused by herbal remedies. And also uh, weightlifting supplements. Uh, yeah, alcoholic. Those things, those things are really bad. And the diet drugs, a lot of the over-the-counter over diet diet Right, so a lot of stuff is over-the-counter. They don't consider it medicine, so they don't tell you. So you really got to, like, beat them on a rubber hose. Right, right. Get it out of them. And the medical student has the time to sit at the bedside and ask right. about everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, I mean, this is one, one, one area where just, you know, budgeting some extra time to do good history taking may be, may be worthwhile. Um, Antabuse disulfiram is also listed among potential uh, dilly causes of acute liver failure. Um, a lot of the vascular causes are important to identify because these are ones where you have to treat the underlying problem and this patient may not be well served by rushing them into a liver transplant. So shock liver, heat stroke, um, a lot of these will get better with supportive care, um, right heart failure, um, Bud Chiari syndrome. We've had cases where we've been able to salvage these patients with a TIPS uh, rather than having to do a transplant. So again, um, really kind of getting down to the underlying cause is very important. Um, Pregnancy-related causes, acute fatty liver pregnancy, um, Wilson's disease, and then, um, and then be, be, be on the alert uh, for potential um, oncologic causes of liver failure through malignant infiltration. So the, the types of um, cancers that can metastasize to the liver in an infiltrative way are breast, small cell lung cancer, lymphoma, melanoma. This may not be apparent on imaging when you image because it's infiltrative, so it can be a little bit tricky and you may not be able to make the diagnosis without a biopsy. Um, autoimmune hepatitis and then um, just various indeterminate causes. Yeah? I think about autoimmune because they're not, I thought one of the conditions was that they're not supposed to have pre-existing liver disease, so mm -hmm. for these patients, if they were to go into a flare, mm -hmm. um, how does that change whether or not they're yeah, these are, this is so tricky, and we struggle with this at our Monday recipient review meetings. Um, they can behave like culminants, and ultimately what we, you know, if we come to a team consensus that we think that this patient has a, has, has a prognosis equivalent to an acute liver failure type of a clinical scenario, we have to write a narrative. Is that Tom? <laughs> Usually we end up having to write it. Um, I just want to point out some geographic differences in the breakdown of causes of acute liver failure. So here in the U.S., Tylenol is the number one cause. Um, same thing in, in the U.K. If you look at areas like um, in, uh, South Asia, hepatitis E is the number one cause of acute liver failure. Um, that's important to keep in mind with our immigrant um, population here, so you know, we get transfers over from, you know, Elmhurst or, you know, patients uh, who, or even patients who have been visiting, you know, traveling and then coming back with hepatitis E. So, so keep that in your differential diagnosis. And then hepatitis B in Asia and Africa are common causes. Um, so your initial laboratory analysis is going to include the viral hepatitis serologies, um, ceruloplasmin, 
um, autoimmune markers, and then various uh, labs to um, that that we'll we'll, we'll discuss in a in a moment um, to uh, help with prognostication and also monitoring the um, the course of the of the liver failure. Um, when they first present, um, you have to send uh, two uh, two blood types, two ABOs, so they have to be drawn on separate occasions in order to uh, separate lab draws in order to list these patients. And then they need they all need HIV testing also in order to list. So some of these time is of the essence in listing these patients. So sometimes just a delay and and just getting a, a blood type can can mean a big difference for these patients. There is a um, acute liver failure protocol that's in your manual, and it's also um, accessible through the website. Um, to uh, it's it's on the ICU. Um, the MICU website, so all the MICU health staff know how to access that. And it has the whole laundry list of things to send off. There's no order set for all of this, though. <laughs> okay. um, and then another, another one to just remember is an um, arterial and ABG and arterial ammonia. We'll talk about that in a moment. Just some diagnostic pearls. Tylenol cases tend to present with very high aminotransferases and a modest bilirubin elevation. Wilson's disease will give you a normal outfoss, and um, you can have elevated bilirubin from uh, a Coombs negative hemolytic anemia, so the bilirubin outfoss ratio uh, tends to be over two. And then for HSV, you can have a disproportionately uh, normal bilirubin. Um, again, identifying the Culprit is important in um, timely, um, timely decision-making about uh, management. So for Tylenol toxicity and acet and acetylcysteine, there is some uh, evidence to suggest benefit from IV and acetylcysteine in even non-Tylenol cases. Um, it's, if patients who present with early encephalopathy, it can help to um, prevent progression of their encephalopathy. Uh, HSV, acyclovir, autoimmune hepatitis, it's a little controversial, you know, giving steroids, they're at such high infection risk. So that's another one of these decision-making nodal points that we struggle with as a, as a team. Um, and then for the pregnancy-related causes, usually delivery will, will be the treatment. So um, the Tylenol cases um, uh, are treated with IV and acetylcysteine. Um, usually you're not involved in decision making about charcoal, activated charcoal, that, that usually happens in the ER when they, when they present there. Um, and then a lot of times the Mickey or the house staff will ask about when to stop the <coughs> IV and acetylcysteine, a lot of the protocols say 72 hours. Really you, keep, you can keep it on board until the liver gets better and what is, how, how, would, how do you define that? I, I usually just wait till the INR realizes, but you know, this isn't in guidelines or anything. Anything that's evidence driven. Um, so this is how N-acetylcysteine works. So Tylenol is normally excreted through glucuronidation and sulf uh, sulfation uh, through these these pathways. When you take too much Tylenol, you overwhelm these usual pathways of elimination, and then you generate this toxic reactive intermediate NAPKE. So N-acetylcysteine um, provides uh, glutathione to allow elimination of the NAPKE. Um, patients who have been fasting or have uh, poor nutrition, like you know, chronic alcoholics, are going to be deplete in glutathione stores and are particularly prone to uh, Tylenol uh, toxicity for this, for this reason. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time on this graph which shows you outcomes of, um, this, this is data from the acute liver failure study group. And um, f forget about the various different shades of gray, just concentrate on the bars and the dots. So if we look at the bars first, <laughs> this shows you of all the cases of acute liver failure in the US, uh, what the underlying cause is. And so the vast majority of cases are caused by acetaminophen. Second is indeterminate, next is drug-induced 
And then the other ones are listed here, Hep B, which this is somewhat old data, 2002. Now, now we don't see as much Hep B with effective antiviral therapy. Um, Hep A, autoimmune here, Wilson's, um, and then various other causes. The dots show you transplant-free survival rate. So fortunately, although Tylenol is the leading cause of acute liver failure, it has the tra highest transplant-free survival. The lowest transplant-free survival rates are with uh, Wilson's disease, autoimmune hepatitis, in indeterminate causes. The drug-induced causes of acute liver failure don't do well. So Wilson's disease, universally, they need, they need a transplant. Um, this, this is also um, data from, uh, from the US that just breaks down all the different causes of drug-induced liver, uh, liver, liver injury. And you can see um, it's just a list of lots of different uh, meds. But I just want to highlight the more frequent causes. So um, isoniazid, um, which you see in parentheses, is the number of cases out of all you know, this whole series. So isoniazid was a common culprit. Uh, phenytoin, valproate, and among the antibiotics, nitrofurantoin was the number one cause. Um, nitrofurantoin is a little tricky because it's more of like a drug-induced autoimmune hepatitis. Um, Augmentin is here, amoxicillin and clavulanate. There's another study, I didn't reference it here, that comes out of Spain. They reported all the causes of drug-induced um, acute liver injury, and augmentin was actually number, number one. Um, and some of the reason for, for like, uh, you know, these antibiotics is being culprits is because they're used so, so commonly. Um, and I'll also highlight, I mean, we, we talk about statins and how they're safe in liver disease, which in, generally, in general they are. They're, they're often underused or inappropriately discontinued, particularly in patients with, Na with NASH. But they can and they have been reported to cause acute liver failure. So don't forget that. OK, so the prognostic models that um, have been reported are um, King's College criteria. We'll go through the uh, cliche criteria. And then there's limited data looking at MELD. The other predictors that you can think about sending off when these patients first present are um, arterial ammonia. So when the level is over um, 150, these are patients who are at higher risk for cerebral edema and brainstem herniation. So that's a poor prognostic sign. Um, high lactate, um, high phos phosphorus, and low alpha, fetal pro uh, low alpha fetal protein. So, so the phosphorus is if, they, if you have liver regeneration, you should be using up, your, um, using up your ATP. So you would expect low phosphorus in a patient who's regenerating. Similarly, alpha fetal protein, um, if they're regenerating, that you know, um, you, you would expect to see a high alpha fetal protein, and that's another common question that can come up from the medical team: is oh gosh, does this patient have liver cancer because their alpha fetal protein is high? And you, your answer is no. It's a good thing; it means that their liver is regenerating. Um, these are the King's College criteria. Importantly, there's a distinction between acetaminophen causes and non-acetaminophen causes. So if we start here with the acetaminophen causes, the predictors of poor outcome are um, on presentation, low pH, uh, advanced encephalopathy, INR over 6.5, or renal failure. And if you have um, either a low pH on presentation or all three of these, uh, the expected mortality is 80% without a transplant. And, you know, these were published, what, like in the 1980s, a long time ago, but they've, like, been validated over and over again. So it's kind of one of these nice little tried and true um, models that we've been able to um, still use. The non-acetaminophen criteria are a little different. Uh, so the poor prognostic mm -hmm. Signs are um, elevated INR or any three of the following. So um, a young age or age over 40, um, idiosyncratic drug-induced or Wilson. So that kind of takes us back to that same chart that I showed you earlier where the etiology makes a difference. INR over 3.8, high bilirubin, or you know these less the, the, the non um, hyperacute presentation, so period of jaundice to encephalopathy over seven days. Um, 
I never remember these. <laughs> I always have to look it up. I don't know. Maybe maybe a simple way to just combine these is regardless of the etiology, elevated INR over 6.5 is a poor presenting sign. Um, but yeah. So I'll just make the point to the fellows that I would say most of the time an ER or a referring center calling about a, a true uh, kidney liver failure patient, they, they never have the pH. Really got to ask for blood gas. That's one thing that we don't normally ask for in general. So it's really a unique thing that don't be afraid to ask. Them so that's a really crucial thing. It's a single, you know, prognostic sign that's really important. Um, and also, I'll point out that uh, the, the definition of acute liver failure is INR equal to or greater than 1.5, right? So the sensitivity is trying to be quite high to capture, you know, a lot of these patients, right? But to actually need transplant to INR is quite, is much higher than that, actually. So um, people you get a little confused about those two things. You don't have to have an INR. Five to like, to account for that, it really just has to be a minimal range. Also, the pH has to be an arterial pH, correct? Yeah, yeah, arterial. So yes. often, you know, like they never, no one ever sends APGs. So, like, yeah. especially from the ER, they even have data to suggest that they shouldn't do it, like ER data for APGs versus APGs. So that's important. That another point. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. Um, and as long as they're sending off the ABG, you can ask them to send the arterial ammonia also. Um, okay. These are the um, the the pre sheet criteria out of French uh, out of France. So um, grade three encephalopathy in combination with a low factor five level. Do you guys know why factor five is part of the criteria? Should it factor five compensate if your other deliver factors are going? So it's produced by the liver. And um, why not one of the other factors? Like the shortest life. Exactly right. Has the shortest half life. So so low factor five level is a poor uh, poor prognostic sign. Um, I don't know. It's just you know there's no one single test that we use. So it's just a it's it, you you put them all together. So it's another thing that you you, you would have to ask for. The MICU doesn't send this off automatically. Um, how about MELD? We like to throw around MELD. Um, the data is not that strong, but if you if you want to use it, we have the labs to, to calculate. This is one uh, study out of Argentina, and the left side shows you uh, survival with um, medical therapy alone, and this shows you patients who died with med uh, with medical therapy alone. And patients who presented with MELD over 30 were um, unlikely to uh, survive just with supportive care. And this is a this is out of um, India, I think. Um, patients presenting with acute liver failure who either survived or died, and um, their cutoff if they used a MELD of 33 gave a um, C statistic of 0.7. So, just another another. If you like to you think in terms of MELD, uh, some data to support that. Um, okay, so let's talk about aspects of clinical management. So, so acute liver failure is one of these um, entities that affects all the organ systems. Um, patients die of uh, cerebral edema, so that's the number one cause. And so our number one goal is to protect the brain um, when these patients uh, present. Number two uh, cause of death is infection and sepsis. Um, so just maintaining a really, really high uh, vigilance and uh, for infection, low threshold to um, send cultures and start uh, empiric antibiotics. Uh, these patients have hemodynamic um, changes, uh, so low systemic vascular resistance and um, increased cardiac output. Uh, they can have renal failure, and then they have metabolic uh, consequences of liver failure or hyperglycemia. So you have to keep up with the um, their glucose, um, and then they can have coagulopathy as well, of course. So um, let's talk about encephalopathy. It's the number one cause of mortality in these patients. So normally, um, nitrogen that gets absorbed from the gut um, can get eliminated through the urea cycle, 
and if your liver is not working, your urea cycle is um, not available to eliminate, so you build up ammonia in your bloodstream. It crosses the blood-brain barrier, combines with, with glutamate and to form glutamine, and it's the glutamine that enters the astrocytes and can't leave the astrocytes. So there's different theories about why cerebral edema develops, so one of them is the glutamine um, in, within the astrocytes uh, acts osmotically to draw water in. Um, perhaps there's some primary injury to astrocytes as well. And then also with the, these uh, vascular uh, uh, ch changes in vascular resistance, you can get breakdown of the blood-brain barrier and get phasogenic edema. So this is why, um, so again, so glutamine drawing in um, uh, water also me, one theory is that there's impaired um, exchange of the sodium uh, potassium transporter. You build, you build up extra sodium within the uh, astrocytes that draws in water. So, I just have this up here just to highlight how um, sensitive the brain and the astrocytes are to fluid shifts and serum sodium level. So this is one rationale for keeping patients on the hypernatremic side, and this is where fluid management is so sensitive and tricky with these patients. Um, when we admit these patients, there's a neurosurgical team that comes over, and depending who's on service, um, they're either more or less involved in working with the ICU team to choose the right kind of IV fluids for these patients. Um, I don't underestimate the um, importance of just little changes in fluid or, or rate. So we had a patient last month who came over with acute liver failure from hepatitis B, and he was, it seemed like he was going into um, like progressive stages of encephalopathy, he was intubated, and um, they, he got a, a bolus of hypertonic saline, and just with the 250 cc, no, it was, I think it was 500 cc bolus of hypertonic saline, he like third spaced into his uh, lungs and developed ARDS. So it's just these, I, I feel like fluid management is just so critical with these patients, but you know, there's, um, not a lot that we have to, to, to guide us. And every case is going to be different. So some of these patients are volume deplete, so they do need the volume. Um, it, it's really tricky. You just have to work with the ICU team and, and the neurosurgical team with these patients. Um, so these are the different stages of hepatic encephalopathy. <laughs> when you're getting the call from an outside hospital, it's like really, really low threshold to intubate these patients before coming over here. They can progress to deeper stages very quickly. Um, when they get to stage four, by the time you're here in stage four in deep coma, cerebral edema occurs in 75% of cases. Um, when they present to the ER, it can, it, this is more of a, you know, ER kind of point than, than us, but you know, a lot of these, a lot of times these, these patients can be agitated in the ER and, you know, there's, there's this assumption that the patient has been taking something when, in fact, they're actually developing encephalopathy. So your communication with the ER before transfer is going to be really important, and your advice about how to, what, what sorts of tests to send off and how to manage these patients is going to be um, important. For, for encephalopathy, yeah. like once they reach the is a neurosurgical consult like a blanket consult for all these patients? Yeah, yeah, any encephalopathy. Because you know what, they'd rather be called earlier rather than later, so that they can assess the, the neuro their neuro status and, and behavior. Yeah. A lot of times, they don't get called until the patient's already been sedated for the intubation, um, and that makes it really difficult for them to do a neuro assessment. Are they are they more aggressive here with the bolt or the tense? Um, the best it was not. We haven't done a bolt in years. It's been a while. It depends who's on surface. Um, we'll talk about that. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Did, um, yeah. We'll talk about that. If you're seeing these signs, it's too late. <laughs> so these are signs of impending herniation. So if you're seeing the Cushing reflex, systemic hypertension with bradycardia, if they're having posturing symptoms or loss of pupillary reflexes, these are all bad signs. So frequent neurochecks is really important with these patients. 
So, you know, neuro checks at least every four hours, if not more frequently than that. Try to avoid sedatives, um, correct any hyponatremia, and then little things like keeping the head of the bed elevated, being careful about volume repletion, uh, minimizing noxious stimuli, anything that will, that will um, bring the pressure too high in the brain. And then um, uh, uh, usually, you know, usually things like mannitol would be used with a bolt in place so that you can monitor response, but sometimes we'll do it empirically even without the bolt in place. Um, they're doing they're doing these trans using these transcranial Dopplers now as sort of a surrogate, but I haven't seen any good data with that. Um, so there's there there are some small studies looking at use of hypertonic saline, and then there's the U.S. Acute Liver Failure Study Group published their um, analysis on the role of hypothermia. So I'll go through this. Um, so. JP, you're asking about a bowl. How can it be helpful? Well, your goal is to maintain adequate cerebral perfusion pressure. So that's defined as your mean arterial pressure minus your intracranial pressure. So you want to keep the mean arterial pressure high enough and your in intracranial pressure low enough in order to maintain that, that um, gradient of pressure. So, um, so your goal is to um, keep the cerebral perfusion pressure over 50 or your intracranial pressure over 20, um, a bolt is what helps you to monitor this accurately. And also what helps you to, um, to, to interventions. Um, it can be used as a um, contraindicate, you know, to, to, to say, okay, transplant is futile if you have a, a very low cerebral perfusion pressure. Um, so the caveats are there's um, no controlled trials that demonstrate survival benefit. And then the problem is that this is a procedure that has great risk. These are coagulopathic patients who um, are going to be at very high bleeding risk um, just through placement of these monitors. Um, so this is the data from the acute liver failure study group on um, use of these intracranial pressure monitors. This is a retrospective um, cohort study. There's no randomized trials. We, I don't think you'll ever see a randomized trial for this. So um, it's the uh, 629 patients who presented with advanced stages of encephalopathy. And you can see that most centers don't use a, a mon an intracranial uh, monitor. So 22% of um, the cases uh, involved use of a monitor. The primary outcome they were looking at is 21-day mortality. And of course, they were interested in whether complications um, occurred and whether placement of the bolt led to um, any differences in management use of these directed therapies. Um, this is busy. Uh, don't worry about reading all the details. I just want to. Um, just point out that at baseline, the the group that got the intracranial pressure monitor versus did the ones that did not were actually a sicker group. They were more likely to be on um, mechanical ventilation. So I know you can't see this, but it's this is um, 98% on a ventilator, 82% uh, that was significant, more likely to be on vasopressors, and more likely to be on renal replacement therapy. So they were a sicker group to begin with. Just keep that in mind. In terms of look, interpreting the mortality. And um, placement of the monitor did result in um, you know, teams being more likely to use directed therapies like mannitol, hypertonic saline, and um, hypothermia and barbiturates. Um, so, in terms of complications, out of the patients who did get a pressure monitor, there was a 7%. Um, incidence of significant bleeding, and there were three deaths due to hemorrhagic complications. So it's not without risk. However, if you compare this to the group who did not get the pressure monitor, there were 13% who died of cerebral edema. So, you know, if they're going to die anyway from cerebral edema, maybe it's it's worth the risk if it's if you're able to um, uh, intervene with with uh, appropriate therapy to bring them, bring it down to get them to a transplant. 
Um, and then, you know, their primary outcome, which was 21 day mortality, was no different between the two groups. So, so um, their conclusion was that the monitoring does not lead to a significant 21 day mortality benefit. However, complications uh, leading to hemorrhage and death were rare. And ultimately, it's center dependent. It depends on your neurosurgical team and also your hematology team and your center specific use of things like factor seven and um, uh, coagulation factors to reduce the, the risk. Um, did they use them at UCLA? Um, we didn't use it. Yeah. How about at Tulane? No. No. I think people are afraid to, to use them. Yeah. Um, how about hypertonic saline? Is there data for this? Uh, this is a small, there, there's not a, really a lot of data. So this, is, this comes out of King's College, and this is back, you know, this is old data. But um, it was a randomized trial, so they had 30 patients with acute liver failure, advanced encephalopathy, and they were randomized to either standard of care or infusion of 30% saline at a low rate to maintain a target serum sodium of 145 to 155, and they all got bolts. <laughs> so this was actually an impressive study that they did. Their primary endpoint was onset of uh, intracranial um, hypertension. And um, the top shows you serum sodium in the group that got the hypertonic saline uh, versus the um, control arm, and so they were successful in maintaining the um, serum sodium at a um, uh, high level. This is time and hours shown you on the bottom. And then you can see that the intracranial pressure um, did decrease in the group that got um, hypertonic saline and it was significant. The um, endpoint of intracranial hypertension um, is shown here. So seven, so almost half of the controls developed intracranial hypertension compared to three out of 15 in the group that got the hypertonic saline. It's a small study, but it shows that that maybe hypertonic saline does, in, in fact, in, reduce the pressures. Um, how about hypothermia? So the, there's an ALF um, pediatric sub-study, you know, subgroup, and hypothermia does benefit the kids, um, but not the adults. Um, so before I go into the acute liver failure study, this is just a small kind of pilot study out of MCV. Um, looking at 14 subjects who had refractory uh, intracranial um, hypertension. So these are patients who had a bolt in place and um, failed mannitol. Um, you can see the intracranial pressure started at um, 36 and then came down with hypothermia. However, there were some side effects and some adverse outcomes. So there were arrhythmias, um, uh, platelet dysfunction, hyperamylacemia. So it's not entirely without risk. Um, the acute liver failure looked retrospectively at a um, subset of patients who got hypothermia. And um, it wasn't used very commonly, only 8% in 8% of the patients. Um, there was no difference in 21-day survival. If they did a subset analysis, if you want to be evidence-based about using this approach, there was a survival benefit in patients presenting with Tylenol who were young with an odds ratio of 2.7, uh, but the survival was lower in Tylenol patients who were over age 64. So, um, so uh, so somehow hypothermia seems to benefit younger patients. Um, so coagulopathy is a um, part of the definition, and um, it's because of decreased synthesis of all your uh, uh, factors that are synthesized in the liver. Again, factor five has the shortest half-life, and so it's a, a good prognostic marker. In addition, patients can have abnormalities in platelet um, count and function. So some, uh, a lot of times you will see the platelet count drop in these patients. So you know, sometimes we use platelet count as a surrogate for, for uh, cirrhosis and advanced liver disease, but you can see the platelets drop in acute liver failure, so don't be fooled by that. Um, we monitor them expectantly, um, don't give product. Bleeding. And the, the team here, and the MICU knows this, but it's usually the outside referring hospitals that you may need to review this with. Of course, if they need to have a line, you can, you can give them products. 
Um, infection is the number two cause of mortality in these patients. So these patients have um, Kupfer cell malfunction, neutrophil malfunction. The risk, of course, increases the longer they're in the hospital. Early on, gram-positive organisms are the um, culprits, and then later on, fungal infections are set in. So you need to maintain a high level of suspicion for infection. Um, so any clinical deterioration, a sudden drop in blood pressure, um, even sudden change in mental status, um, they should all get surveillance cultures. And then low threshold for prophylactic antibiotics. There's no data that supports empiric antibiotics prophylactically for all comers. Try to minimize invasive procedures and lines. Um, hemodynamic changes are a, um, a tricky um, uh, problem to manage, as we discussed. So these patients have low systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance, compensatory increase in cardiac output. They can have um, lactic acidosis from uh, tissue hypoperfusion. So um, again, correcting any component of hypovolemia, the, um, and then giving them pressors as needed. So, so there's some data in acute liver failure for uh, in support of norepinephrine and then addition of vasopressin in norepinephrine refractory cases. Your goal is to, again, maintain that cerebral perfusion pressure by keeping your mean arterial pressure over 75. Um, renal failure is very common. It occurs in um, over half, case of, half of the cases. Sometimes it's direct nephrotoxicity, like in cases of um, uh, Tylenol toxicity and Wilson's disease. Um, and then in general, these patients recover their liver, uh, their kidney function after transplant. So obviously avoid nephrotoxic agents, and some, sometimes these patients will need CVVH. Usually their um, blood pressures won't permit intermittent hemodialysis. The CVVH may also help with reducing ammonia levels to prevent uh, cerebral edema. And um, these patients are at risk for hypoglycemia due to defective gluconeogenesis and alterations in insulin. Um, these patients often will require dextrose with their IV fluid uh, infusions, and they need frequent monitoring of blood glucose levels, so frequent finger sticks. Um, I'll go through uh, outcomes. So when you compare the transplant um, outcomes in acute liver failure compared to chronic liver disease, Within, after the first year, during that first year after transplant, the acute liver failure patients do worse. So this is survival, uh, these survival curves. Once you get to um, beyond, um, like beyond four years, the, the, the lines cross. So they don't do as well early on, but in the long term, they, they, they do just as well as the patients transplanted with chronic liver disease. Um, there have been studies looking at uh, predictors for poor outcomes in these patients transplanted for um, acute liver failure. So this is one study that kind of developed a model of poor predictors. So um, survival following transplant for acute liver failure is decreased um, with these risk factors. So age over 50, elevated BMI if they're on life support or they have renal failure. And the relative risk of post-transplant mortality increases 150% with each additional point. So, um, so in their model, if they had none of these poor prognostic um, predictors, the five-year survival was 81%. However, if they had um, all of these points, their five-year survival was 42%. Um, we, pr practically speaking, you know, we, we don't use any of these as absolute contraindications, but um, just something to keep in mind. And then again, the etiology is also an important um, prognostic indicator. We talked about how it's an important prognostic indicator for survival without transplant. There's also um, uh, ramifications to how these patients do after transplant. So the patients transplanted with viral etiologies tend to do better than patients transplanted for indeterminate or drug-induced liver injury. So a lot of the patients who get drug-induced liver injury will have um, de novo autoimmune hepatitis, <coughs> so, you know, immune mediated problems after, after transplant. Um, and then I just want to finish with this 
notion of acute on chronic <clears throat> liver failure. You've, you've all probably seen this slide and heard about it. But again, just the idea is that the acute on chronic liver failure patients are a completely different group that have a different type of a prognostic curve. So the idea is that if you have a patient with cirrhosis, chronic liver disease, they may start out at a um, uh, less than 100% liver function or functional status. And then they'll undergo some kind of insult like a variceal bleed or SVP, uh, which then um, uh, which, which then you know drops their liver function. And then they 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 will recover, but their recovery is not going to be back to their initial baseline. Um, and if they suffer a second insult, so that might be like the patient who comes in with a variceal bleed, but then gets a hospital acquired pneumonia. Uh, with each of these insults, they're they, they're, they're at risk for um, uh, declining to a lower level of liver function. And this occurs, you know, over a different time course than these acute liver failure patients. And there's a lot of ongoing interest in studying this entity. Um, we can, should we, can we can, do we have time for a, a quick case? So, so this is a case, so this is a patient who um, um, is, presented here at Mount Sinai. So this is a 39-year-old woman who presented to an outside hospital. She was brought in by her husband for lethargy. And they intubated her at the outside ER pretty quickly for airway protection. These were her labs on presentation, pH of 6.8, INR 8. Her amino transferases are in the 1,000 to 2,000 range with a bilia of 2, normal kidney function, and then this is her CBC, her platelets are over 300,000. She has a high lactate and a high FOS. Um, what are your thoughts right now about these labs? It's, she's very ill. Yeah. Um, obviously, I'm just trying to think her ASD is greater than her ALT right now. Um, mm -hmm. Like for other competing causes other than, um, other than liver failure, like something like rhabdo, um, okay. early rhabdo. Um, but if we were to entertain the idea that she has acute liver failure, um, she would have a more prognosis than her pH or lactate. Um, I, would, I would be suspicious for something like town hall toxicity as well. Yeah. 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 Or excuse me, like, for 39 year old that is. Okay. So um, so you're on call and you get this you get this call from an outside hospital. What's your next step? That's the mental sex and the We don't really know her mental yeah. status, <laughs> yeah. which is typical, which is not, not uncommon. <laughs> I, would, I would prioritize sending her over. Yeah. Over. Right. So, I mean, the, the, the pH and the INR are really concerning. Sometimes when, when they present with, um, you know, when, when their labs aren't quite as severe, you can, ask, you can, you can get another set of labs and, and reassess. But this, she's someone who clearly needs to come over right away, and we will we will make a bed for patients like this. <laughs> Is this someone like a pH of six eight and like black? I mean, that's like that's like real low. That's like yeah. Like I don't know, like a pH six eight, like you can, it's like almost like not physiologic, right? Like I mean, some of that in trans, it just is like a, a complicated thing. Where they're like, if somebody were transfer at this moment, it would be like see if they can like bring her back, like bring that pH up a little bit before you. Send for her in a transport vehicle or however she gets here. Mm -hmm. like something may happen in trans. Like, that's like, is this something you would consider or you just bring them as much as we Well, I mean, they have to be stable for trans yeah, yeah. transport, and, and, and that, that, can, that can be tricky, um, but, you know, they, they, should, they, should, they should stabilize the patient within, within reasonable ability yeah. um, so that the patient get, can be. Like, like, right. Stabilize the most of can. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Say so most of the transfers will go to the piece less than seven, and it's pre intubation. So you'll be able to get it That's up. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now they're exactly. They can change the bench. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Renal failure gets more complicated, yeah. but you know, the, the intubation is a key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually the next draw is up. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm.
and even pressors, like sometimes they, they their pressures drop immediately after intubation. They get right. thrown on high dose right. pressors. If they can kind of come down to minimal pressors, we can try to bring them over, right. but not high dose pressors. Um, so then you get some additional history, and she had had a lap coli one week prior. She's taking Vicodin, uh, Norset, which if you kind of add it all up, it equates to 26 grams over three days. And then she has a prior history of depression and alcohol use, although she's been sober for, for three years. And then the Tylenol level at the outside hospital came back positive. Her tox screen was, was negative. Uh, so it sounds like probably Tylenol with a therapeutic misadventure. Um, she's already right. <laughs> she's already showing some signs of hemodynamic compromise. She's tachycardic. She's agitated, um, and um, she has no stigma of chronic liver disease. And she's a little hyperreflexic. Her pupils are reactive, though. So she gets over here, and in the next 24 hours, she gets an expedited uh, transplant workup, and she gets listed. Um, she gets started on IV and acetylcysteine. Her renal function got worse. Got, she got started on CVVH. Um, for whatever reason, I can't remember exactly why, but I think she was just so sick that she just got empiric antibiotics, including fluconazole, um, especially with the renal failure. And her white count dropped um, while on antibiotics, so we were a, a bit concerned about this. She was started on pressors, and um, she ended up needing paralytics for, for her agitation. Um, eventually, she was able to come off the pressors. Her head CT showed some cerebral edema without herniation. She got started on a mannitol even without a bolt. And then a donor offer came up. Um, um, her cultures at that time were negative, and then there was a team consensus to proceed with transplant because she'd been off the pressors by that point. So she was transplanted, and then after transplant, the blood culture from her admission central line <laughs> <laughs> so she actually went to transplant, although she had come off the pressers and her white cap had come up. So it was a good thing in retrospect that she was started on the antifungals. And then just, you know, as a side side note, she ended up developing hep B reactivation from her core antibody positive rep, but that was controlled and she's doing it all now, 10 years after transplant. So. All right, so um, just to sum up, um, these are the um, AASLD guidelines, which also summarizes ICU management. And then there are recent easel guidelines that were uh, published uh, 